fabulous. So welcome to the series, Speaking Up for Point Malate, in which invited speakers uh, address key questions and issues about Point Malate and members of the public can ask questions. We honor the Ohlone people for whom this area is home and who were traditional stewards of this land. The descendants of the Ohlone live among us now as documented by recent DNA studies and they merit our respect for their culture and their ancestors. For an overview, uh, this, David will speak for 30 to 40 minutes, and then he's happy to answer questions. Um, please limit your questions to one minute. Um, if you'd like to raise more complex issues, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll consider them for, um, for future sessions. Uh, and though issues around Point Malate can be uh, somewhat contentious, let's all be polite and courteous. Uh, also, please use the chat to let us know how we can improve or to leave your email if you'd like us to send you announcements directly. Um, all chat will appear in the recording. Um, I'll put the web page for the speaker series into the chat uh, in just a moment uh, so that if you want to make a copy of it, uh, you can use it for future sessions. Um, and we are planning to um, record and post the, um, this session and others uh, on the Point Malati webpage on the Point Malati Alliance website. So um, I'm Sally Tobin. I'm um, co-founder with Pam Stello of this speaker series. Um, our Zoom administrator is Danny Zaki who is the Bay and Shoreline organizer for the San Francisco Bay chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, I'm a biologist and retiree of the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics. Um, I received a PhD in developmental biology from the University of Washington. I belong to the Point Melati Alliance, the Richmond Shoreline Alliance, and the Bay Area Sea Kayakers. And I serve on the board of Citizens for East Shore Parks and live in Richmond. Um, Pam Stello is a co-chair of the Point Malate Alliance and the Richmond Shoreline Alliance and serves on the board of Citizens for East Shore Parks. She lives in Richmond. And this week we are very pleased to present David Helvarg, an author, ocean activist, and member of the Point Malate Alliance. David has written about Point Malate for a range of publications, including the San Francisco Chronicle, the LA Times, The Nation, The Progressive, and the Richmond Community News. He describes Point Malate in greatest detail in his critically acclaimed book, The Golden Shore, California's Love Affair with the Sea. David will talk about what makes Point Malate such a natural topic for art and literature, and he'll read a few excerpts from his book. Um, among other honors and awards, David won the 2020 Rachel Carson Award from the Sierra Club. So without further ado, here's David. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sally, and uh, everyone for being part of this ongoing series, which has kind of covered a wide range of how Point Malati impacts our lives. I think that, um, of course, a sense of place is key to uh, everyone's lives and certainly has been key in the history of art, literature, expression. And that sense of place is often about how we connect as humans with the natural world around us. Um, You've, you've certainly, I, I was just in uh, New York and DC. We had our 20th anniversary for Blue Frontier, which is my ocean conservation group. And I met up with a friend, Carl Safina, another writer and uh, some other folks in New York to go visit the uh, exhibition called Cross Currents on, uh, on um, the uh, well, Winslow Homer, beautiful, largest, collection of his work since um, the 1930s. And a lot of his seascapes, a lot of his later work is based around Prowse Point uh, in Maine, where he lived and where he interacted with the winters. And, and some of the images are stunning. Um, and of course, in literature, you know, I mean, 
in U.S. literature, you've got, you know, Walden Pond with the uh, Thoreau. Um, later, it was Sauk County, Wisconsin, I think, that impacted um, Aldo Leopold when he wrote Sand County Almanac and talked about a land ethic. He was really talking about where he lived, about farmland in Wisconsin. And I think that for a lot of people who live around the Bay, the Bays define their lives. And for a lot of people who've lived in Richmond, um, there's been a lack of connection with the Bay for a number of years. And so when we bring young people out to Point Melody, there's one of those aha moments where you can see that, that opening up. And obviously direct experience is the way you wanna go. I mean, you know, we had uh, the Health Academy at um, Richmond High School out there one time at the beach after we reopened the beach and uh, they were doing water quality testing and Osprey came down, grabbed a fish out of the water and the kids were like, went ballistic. And you just, you know, it's like one of those clicks that, you, that all of us have had in our youth when there's this, this moment and, uh, and then they wanted to have their, their senior, um, senior evening there and they started connecting and we've just gotten a boat Blue Frontier has. We want to start taking young people out to get another perspective on a Point Melody from the water. Um, certainly, you know, it's, it's the natural parts of our lives that kind of inspire our art. And in terms of Point Melody, um, we've got a couple of our own artists aligned with Point Melody Alliance, Jeannie Quartz. If you want to see some of her paintings, you can see them right behind her and Pam. If you just, you know, click through, look at, at uh, who's participating tonight. You can see a couple of Jeannie's pictures. Tarnell Abbott's done some great stuff and even sold some of her paintings to help support our efforts to protect and, and restore Point Melati. Um, photography, we've got, you know, one of our, our previous um, talks for Point Melati was a beautiful, stunning um, series of photos, a, a, you know, slideshow by Jack Scheiman um, has done years photography, you know, of, of amazing nature photography at Point Melati. And, and that show was actually organized by Jeff Peterson, who's another one of Point Melati's photographers. And uh, uh, of course, another Point Melati photographer was Ansel Adams um, in the slideshow. And, and Jack's is kind of amazing to see, you know, every image is, you know, uh, a moment in time kind of preserved that we can reflect on. And so, you know, Ansel Adam took a picture at Point Melati when there was still the active uh, rail wharf going out. And it has, you know, it had been used during the uh, Winehaven period, but it remained through the period of the, the um, Navy Depot. And 60, 70 years later, um, Jack got this in the same position and took a matching photograph that matched Ansel Adams and where the the railhead was and the wharf, there's now just the uh, the pilings and the wildness and that sense of uh, nature reclaiming the works of, of man and woman is kind of part of the attraction of Point Melati. You know, it wasn't just a natural headlands, but it was, it was used and in some ways abused through uh, human engagement over the years as a, um, you know, First, it was, it was part of the opening chapter in my book, The Golden Shores, Native Tides. And of course, for thousands of years, I'm five minutes away from Point Melati, but I'm inside of Brook Island, which has uh, Ohlone uh, Midens and artifacts that are at least 3,000 years old. So the, the sense of the generations that were here at, uh, in Richmond and, and can be reflected in uh, what what the Ohlone and other tribes were living for thousands of years, you can still get a sense of that at Point Melati and, and a few other places. Um, also the natural connections that existed from native grassland watersheds into healthy eelgrass beds, all of that's reflected there and reflected of course in, in inspired music. I mean, Andre Soto, I remember when we, after many years reopened the beach park at Point Melati is what at the time was the beginning of a reopening of the park um, Andre Soto and his band played there more recently. Um, it was a fairly famous band from Mexico City that was just cruising through Richmond. They found Point Melody. They thought, what a great spot for a, a backdrop for a music video. And uh, I was there and Jack was there on unrelated uh, instances. And it's just perfect symmetry that Jack got some great pictures of, of that band. Uh, 
So, you know, music, art, as I say, literature, um, you get inspired by what, both what's there that connects you to the natural world, but also what's threatened, you know, conflict, uh, you know, I've been a journalist for most of my life and then, you know, we report on conflict and uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's conflict that mobilizes people that inspires great art, whether it's Guernica or, or, or you know, um, or, or um, just anything that's uh, being produced today almost um, is, is defined by these deeper elements. So for me, moving here from, uh, you know, I spent most of my life in California, went back to DC for nine years. And when I came back here in 2007, moved back here to Richmond, it was to be close to the water. And I saw Brook Island and just the opportunity to be on the California coast or the coast of the Bay in this case was uh, second largest estuary in North America and very inspired. And then a couple of months into it, uh, this self-defined grassland geek, like Nerov took me on a tour of Point Melati behind the gates on the highlands. And suddenly I'm like, wow, you know, We've, we've got this amazing natural headland right here. And, uh, and it was being sold off for a casino or, you know, and of course it's like anywhere you go, there's the struggle. You know, it's, it's what I said on earth day, you know, how are we going to save the earth 400 acres at a time? So um, I saw the beginnings of what became a, a broad popular community movement. And it, you know, I think one of the things you do in, in writing and literature is try and find common themes, how you connect a place in a sense of, of space to larger issues. I recently wrote a uh, piece for the progressive on, you know, one of the fields we work on uh, with Blue Frontier is uh, ocean climate action and what they call blue carbon, which is the fact that a lot of marine habitats and the algae in the sea and the, and the whales and the krill um, and the seagrass and the kelp, you know, 71% of the planet, it's absorbing 90% of our human generated heat, but it's also part of a solution, you know, that, that these are the systems that can absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, so I recently wrote one piece, I'll just read a brief excerpt, the opening from, uh, well, can the ocean save the planet? Subtitles, the idea of ocean-based climate solutions appealing, but the challenges are formidable. And I thought, you know, it's a global story, but I open it locally. I say, marine technicians, Margot Buckbinder and Louis Hernandez, unlock a chain link gate, chain link gate at Point Melati, a natural headland on San Francisco Bay, drive to the water's edge along a degraded road, part of what was once a World War II Navy fuel depot. From here, they climb down concrete blocks and boulders in the fading light of dusk. Wearing full wetsuits and booties, they shuffle through the mud and shallow water of low tide. The shuffling helps warn bat rays to get out of their way. Using a marine GPS finder, they quickly locate and retrieve a couple of remote sensors about the size of nine volt batteries that measure the water's temperature and salinity around local eelgrass beds. Slogging back towards shore, they're backlit by the lights of an oil tanker docked at the local Chevron refinery's Long Wharf. The pair's work is part of research being conducted by San Francisco State University's uh -huh. Catherine Boyer on the ecology and restoration of coastal habitats, including San Francisco Bay's approximately 3,000 acres of eelgrass. Eelgrass, a species of seagrass, along with kelp, coastal salt marshes, mangroves, and other marine plants and animals, including whales, have long been acknowledged as essential for ocean health. They're now being recognized also as blue carbon sinks, sequesters of excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere generated from the burning of fossil fuels and other sources. And then I quote, I suspect but don't know yet that natural eelgrass beds, like Point Melati's, will have more carbon sequestration in the sediment than restored beds, but restoration will also put you somewhere along the trajectory, says Boyer, whose team uses the historic eelgrass at Point Melati as a seeding bed for restoration elsewhere in the Bay. It's all part of the solution she offers, but we've got to deal with the missions. We don't solve the problem. And then I talk about, you go through, you go off the eelgrass in Point Melati and you go through the Golden Gate and take a right and you hit the, the declining massively 
declined uh, kelp forests of Northern California that have been decimated since 2014 uh, as a direct result of climate change and warming waters and their impacts on um, both the kelp itself and, and the sea stars that predate on the purple urchins that have then come in and helped finish off the kelp. And talking about you know, these global challenges, um, it just makes sense to start local because that's where people work. You know, when we were young, the first Earth Day, they said, you know, think globally, act locally. Well, unfortunately, today we have to think and act locally, regionally, globally, simultaneously, because those are the kind of challenges we're facing. But I think that, um, you know, telling stories is what humans do. And uh, we've got a great story here. It's a, a story not only of nature, but of why nature is often unprotected. Um, you know, you go out to Point Malati and you realize that this is nature restored from uh, what was historically Ohlone land and then Chinese fish camp. And then, you know, uh, California's largest winery complex where they built a brick castle of all things. And also, uh, you know, before the Navy came in and, uh, and created an oil depot that helped win the world for democracy against fascism and, and Japanese imperialism in World War II. Um, we also had the, the whaling station at the end of the peninsula that was the last whaling station in America. Um, so, you know, it didn't close down until 1971. So there's this rich history overlaid by this natural um, headlands, the last unprotected headlands on the Bay Area. And it's not tricky to figure out why it is unprotected, why it hasn't been a park for a generation or more. And that's because Richmond is a low income community of color that historically is underparked and underserved. And, and that's what the struggle has been about. And, you know, we won a battle in 2010 and I, it was a battle worth recording in, in my writing. Um, but the, that battle was not the end in my book, it's the victory. But as Peter Douglas used to say, the coast is never saved, it's always being saved. So that victory has to be repeated. We, we won an election in 2010. In 2020, we're ready for another election, 2019, when COVID shut us down. And so one of the things that we, the Point Melody Alliance did is, is start writing again. And we produced the bilingual Richmond Community News. We put out two issues before the 2020 election. Um, this cover story, Racial and Climate Justice for Point Melody, I got to write with uh, Courtney Cummings, who's, uh, who founded the Richmond Pow Wow, represents the Ohlone. Uh, her mother founded the Richmond uh, Native American Community Health Center. Um, and, and so that you know, historic continuity continues. And, and we, we built you know, what this series does. And this series is also kind of, you know, it's, it's show and tell. It's talking to people about what's real and the diversity of interests that benefit when we do the right thing. Um, as I say, I, I moved here in uh, 2007 and um, suddenly discovered that, you know, I didn't have to go to Point Reyes or up into the Redwoods to discover a local natural wonder. I knew the Bay is a wonder. I mean, I'm all about um, the marine environment and, the, and really water, whether it's salty, brackish, or sweet water. I mean, and we have it all right here in Richmond where the bay flushes into, uh, in and out with the tides and salinity shifts around our eelgrass beds. And, you know, once I saw a, a misplaced salmon wandering up Meeker Creek, which is our local creek here in the uh, Richmond Marina. But I thought I'd read just a few parts of, so as I say, The Golden Shore, California's Love Affair with the Sea. Um, one of my books and I open it in Richmond and then the first chapter is native tides about you know what what our coastal cultures were like before colonial settlement uh, talk about the ports talk about uh, um, surfing talk about the navy talk about the diversity of blue interest that that works for California I mean what we're looking from Point Melody to build back better to UN ocean treaties and climate treaties, but we're looking for solutions that can grow faster than the problems. 
And I think this is my most optimistic book because California, despite being a late maritime colonial frontier, um, has learned and has become a model for how to live well with the coast and ocean. And that was also what, when I moved here, discovered Point Melati and discovered five out of seven city council members were ready to vote to turn it into a casino. Um, by then I'd already learned enough to, to have faith. So I'll just read a couple of uh, segments. This is from the end of the book, close to the end, chapter called Rising Tides, because there are always new challenges and now climate change is a major challenge for California. You can do right by your coast and ocean in one state and be a global model, but you can't produce global solutions to issues like climate in one state. And so we're facing new disasters. I say every epic tale somewhere close to the end should include a scene of homecoming and of a battle won. I became aware of one of my own city's natural treasures only in 2009. So it was actually two years after I moved here. 422 acres of spectacular San Francisco Bay facing green space and submerged eelgrass meadows that the city council planned to sell off for mega casino development. Point Melati, located just north of the Richmond Bridge to Marin, contains a historic wine port with a brick castle that later became a Navy fuel oil depot before the Navy sold it to the city for a dollar in 2003. Moving from alcohol to petroleum to gambling might make sense in terms of a continuity of human addictions, but otherwise I didn't get it. As a friend who works on Bay Area watershed restoration noted, Point Melati is the most beautiful part of the Bay no one's ever heard of. The headland is an example of the resiliency of nature left unpaved, rapidly reclaiming its terrestrial areas, hilly coastal grassland and range managed by mule deer and wild turkey with colossal toyons, Christmas berry shrubs, the sides of live oaks. And there are also live oaks, federally protected Sassoon marsh aster, native Malate blue fescue, a unique local bunch grass, horticulturist have bred for landscaping. There's coyote brush, wild mint, Dutchman's pipe vine, and it's rarely seen companion, the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly, except we see them in abundance every spring at Point Malati. This is the most beautiful area imaginable for grassland geeks. Lech Nemovich, a red bearded botanist said happily as he showed me around. Just offshore by an old wharf, acres of submerged aquatic plants acted as a nursery and sanctuary for bay fish and marine wildlife. After hiking around the headlands, I was convinced this could be the third emerald jewel of bay facing green parks along with the Presidio of San Francisco and Fort Baker and Marin. And then I talk about the struggle of both the community for fair housing, for you know, for park land, um, what was happening at the time, the idea of uh, the casino battle, which ended with an election. The casino developer had promised, you know, jobs for people. You can all have jobs. You're poor people. You should be happy to be maids and security guards till we took it to a vote and citizens voted 58 to 42 percent against the casino. So, uh, I say the Point Melati victory showed what a dynamic coalition of environmentalists and political progressives with deep roots in their community can achieve. But I think something more was also at play, and this is kind of the theme of my book. From the beginning, when the casino had a big majority of council votes and looked to be a sure bet, I thought Point Melati could still be saved because there's a history on the bay and along the shore of preventing badly thought out development schemes that might undermine the natural beauty, ecological integrity, and public access or ownership that have become a hallmark of much of California's coast and ocean. I felt citizens for sustainable Point Melati, which was the precursor of Point Melati Alliance. I thought citizens for sustainable Point Melati and its leaders were walking the same path of protest and organizing earlier trod by Save San Francisco Bay's founding mothers by the Sierra Club of the 1970s that helped establish the Golden Gate National Recreation Era and by many other activists who believed failure was not a viable option. When it comes to protecting public lands, watersheds, and the oceans, you can't save them here, you can't save them anywhere. And I'll just go on a little bit more. On Earth Day 2012, 75 people participated in a cleanup at Point Melati Beach, the loveliest shoreline in the city, which had been closed to the public since 2004 due to budget cuts. It's a warm day under Robin's Egg blue sky as we collect a truckload of trash off this half mile crescent of sand. CFSM volunteers, Joan, Pam, and Charles 
like the botanist and his 13-month-old daughter, Kaya, are here as are a number of families. A couple of kayakers, sailors from a nearby marina, dogs, photographers, a city councilman, and the mayor and her husband, who seem delighted with our work. Longtime resident Sally uh, Ambury says her family swam here 35 years ago. Community activist Andre Soto tells us he came here as a teen in the 1980s. It was a makeout scene for us, isolated, a place we could come and have some fun. He grins with a slightly wicked nostalgia. My friend Lincoln and I dig up a buried tire, pick up shotgun shells for full mercury sail, sail bag, some oil boom that must be left over from the Costco Busan spill. Another guy finds a complete marine toilet. Just offshore, a sea lion cruises by. Pelicans fly overhead. Andres and three other guys rig a rope sling to carry a 300 pound rusted pipe off the beach. After three hours, the beach is clean. We gather on the grassy tree shaded bluff for food prepared by CJ's barbecue and fish, a local favorite. Small groups gather under the trees to look out across the bay. There's some talk about UC Berkeley's recent decision to open a major research lab at the other end of the city's waterfront. It would work on clean energy and bring an initial 800 jobs to Richmond with more to follow. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Things feel good getting together with our neighbors, cleaning up our commons. We're expecting the city will reopen the beach shortly, which it unanimously voted to do in July 2012 and did in 2014. First step to opening up all of Point Melati, restoring this sometimes abused but still vibrant natural headland may take a long uh, may take a long time, but that's okay. Because to paraphrase Peter Douglas, the bay is never saved. The bay is always being saved. So, of course, when this uh, book first came out ten years ago, it looked like we're going. We had a plan to open up Point Melati, all of it, for the citizens. And as the best laid plans, they say, we got a new mayor who had different plans to gentrify the shoreline and uh, drive out the the present residents or outprice the present residents. And so our efforts were, again, to mobilize the community and have a better vision. And we fought around that vision for seven years now. And uh, we've got a new city council that also has a vision um, that's in line with ours uh, to provide key public, hand, public lands and public la hands. And, um, and to provide a place that can inspire our youth and the next generation of writers and artists and photographers. And in the interim, we use our observational skills. Uh, we use our music and our sense of wonder to promote solutions that work. So that's, that's kind of the brief summary of, of how I think that uh, writers and artists can contribute to the uh, the recognition of an unrecognized uh, jewel on San Francisco Bay, and at the same time, um, help right wrongs and restore uh, environmental justice and climate justice for people who um, deserve equity but have been denied it for too long, from the original um, stewards of the land, from the Ohlone to the uh, to the diverse and, and uh, the amazing community that Richmond is today. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my thoughts from uh, wearing my writer's hat. And uh, as a journalist, it's also a great story that's underreported. I've uh, tried to do what I can and hopefully we can entice others now that we're at a critical moment in the evolution of, of Point Melati and one in which we might realize our vision of uh, 12 years ago to open up not just the beach, but all of it um, to the people of Richmond, the Bay, and the world. So let's, uh, we're ready for Q&A. Thank you, David. That was inspirational. Um, uh, Pam Stello is handling the question period today. Uh, Pam, are you ready? Yes. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We welcome questions. If you have a question, please use your electronic raised hand, which is sometimes under reactions. For those on phones, press six to mute and unmute and nine to raise your hand. I'll call on speakers and I'll be checking the chat for additional questions and comments. Right, if you got a statement, just disguise it as a question. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, Pam, as the host, you got to start it off if nobody else does. Okay. So this has been quite a turbulent battle for all of us. What, given that you've studied the, the coastline and other battles, what's the most surprising thing about this fight for Point Malate? Um, surprising, I'd say, one, that it hasn't gotten more attention because it really meets all the criteria of what are the issues of today, which is, you know, protection of, of natural resources, um, carbon, uh, carbon and climate justice, um, equity. I mean, you, you know, sort of in my other hat as a political agitator, activist, you're looking for solutions that, you know, combine the benefits of the environment, the economy, and equity. And Point Melody as an issue has all those elements. So I'm surprised it's not gotten more attention, uh, both in, in the Bay Media and beyond. And I think, again, it's, it's a function of, of stereotyping low-income communities of color as not being environmental when, in fact, you know, this is one of the, the, the key demands of the community is having access to this land for uh, multiple recreational, natural, and educational uses. So that's surprising that we haven't gotten more coverage. And I guess, um, I don't know, I think it's, uh, I'd say that's that's the major one. All, also just that it's been, well, I shouldn't be surprised it's been as hard as it is, but um, I really thought, you know, when this book came out, I thought we'd won it. And so we have to put a lot of energy to keep fighting the same battles repeatedly until, until we win them. Thank you. Chip Gribble has a question. I, I wonder about the, uh, the history of the, uh, of the Point Malade with regard to Chevron's uh, role in the, in the uh, evolution or the history there. I would, have, I would expect that they were happy with the Navy setting up shop there in World War II. Um, but post-World War II, uh, my guess is that um, they would have opposed uh, the development uh, in the more recent decades. Is that, is that correct or is there more, more there? No, they, it's correct. They definitely, you know, they have fence line communities that are high risk. And what they didn't want is, uh, you know, a new population um, right on their, on their fence line along Point Melody, right over their 400 foot ridge line. Um, you know, they're a accident prone 110 year old refinery. So in fact, in the early history, which I, I believe uh, Robert Chesty may have uh, reviewed in an earlier one of these sessions, um, Chevron was real, willing to put down large amounts of money to secure Point Melody as a, uh, as a park, as an open space. And at the time, uh, parts of the city council had visions of hundreds of millions and billions of dollars from gambling and wasn't interested. Um, I think that today, Chevron's standing back. Again, they don't want the idea of a luxury housing development with lots of wealthy people with lawyers on their fence line when they're having you know, more flare-offs and when they have a history of accidents. They don't want that, but at the same time, the progressive majority on the city council that uh, would support a park would also support decommissioning Chevron. So I think that uh, they're sort of, they may not want the liability, but they also don't want to work with progressives who want to transition off of fossil fuels and move to the next, you know, energy transition to clean renewable energies. That's not what they're about. Debbie Baer. Hey, um, uh, I guess it's not a question, but um, it, it, it's it's asking for a comment from you because I think David, it was me reading in um, maybe that book about uh, how the Marin headlands were saved, you know, all the way up from from uh, uh, you know up the coast from being developed. It was a, really a surprise to me that they were gonna develop all that land that's now parkland. And um, was, was that your book? 
is that was talking about that and, yeah. and how and what got me was they were um the people who did it were a lot of um high and they were wealthy or well-connected republican women who got together and were and did it with and they had connections so that that goes to what you were saying about richmond and um it, 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 tell me if i'm wrong that was the impression i got and um you know, and I thought when I read that, I thought, well, shit, <laughs> we don't have wealthy, well-connected Republican women on our side. And, uh, and, and well, it, me it, out, but it uh, wasn't entirely. I mean, there were three well-to-do women, including the wife of the president of UC Berkeley, who started Save the Bay, which was sort of the first campaign to uh, when the Army Corps engineers planned to fill in two thirds of the remaining bay and turn it into a wide spot in the Sacramento River. Uh, three well-to-do women who got mobilized because the Sierra Club and other groups weren't ready to, and they hooked up with an effective uh, DJ on the radio, but it very quickly became a, a community-wide campaign, a Bay-wide campaign. And then, you know, um, the 1916, 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill, that was sort of the same year that the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Those were sort of, you know, the the oil birds on Santa Barbara Beach and, and the Burning River kind of inspired the next year's Earth Day. And so the timing was sort of right. In 72, we took the uh, Coastal Commission initiative and, you know, voted it into existence when the state house was too uh, unwilling or corrupted to take action. And so that initiative really began, the, you know, the, the rollback. Until then, it was all about coastal development. The plans were to basically expand route one to four lanes or possibly eight lanes to connect it all up with 101 every 20 miles there'd be a lateral road to connect it they'd build cities up the coast you know kind of extend Newport Beach to the Oregon border and they were going to power them with the nuclear power plants and uh, water them with every river that was undammed in the state uh, you go to Bodega Bay today and on the head you can find the uh the hole that PG&E built for the uh, for the nuclear power yeah. park they were going to build there with three or four nukes, even though it was a fault line, and uh, that was stopped. And the city of half a million that was going to be Bodega Bay is is still pretty quiet. And I think that um, what you saw in the Bay Area is after Point Reyes was established, um, you had Phil Burton who was like this tough Democrat who just keep building parks. And he said, well, it's great, you know, that people with cars can go out to Point Reyes, but what about the urban folk of the Bay Area? And so he took the initiative to create the Golden Gate uh, National Recreation Area, GGNRA. And that's created a, a basically a, a pearl string of parks up and down um, and around San Francisco Bay, but the GGNR never really extended to the East Bay. And so I think we're, you know, you talk about historic opportunities and moments. I think 40 years later, we have an opportunity to extend a network of parks that were for urban California, for the Bay Area, um, extend that GGNR concept over to the East Bay and, and connect up, uh, you know, Point Milati with uh, Point Pinole and all the land in between could be, uh, you know, public land that, that serves the, the recreational and educational and, and just the, the spiritual needs of, of people's ability to connect with nature. So yeah, there were some well-to-do women who started it at the beginning, but then it became the Coastal Commission. And before that, um, it was BCDC, the, the, um, uh, the Bay Conservation Development Council. And one of our recent victories on Point Milati was when the BCDC, we reminded them that their name was conservation came before development and there's no way that they should allow um Port Milati, which they've already designated the shoreline as parkland to even begin to consider developing it as luxury housing that would deny uh the people of richmond the opportunity to benefit from a natural connection thank you so, jamie um, jamie Hi. Uh, so, um, so I know of your book. I know there's 
some poets. Um, and I, of course, um, Pan and Jeannie have wonderful uh, paintings. But um, like, do you, has there been any sort of like, I guess, uh, what's the, how, did, how did I describe it? Uh, has there been any assemblage of the art that has been dedicated to Point Melati in order to be able to try and show the, the community and uh, the kind of cultural connection that people have with the land that, because there's always this referral to the wine haven and there's always referral to the Navy base, but the really like one of the things that I have found really interesting is uh, people's memories of growing up here and being just at the beach. And, and so I'm wondering if there, um, has anybody done such a, a, a piece like that? And if they have not, why don't we? <laughs> we should. I think we had I mean, one exhibit. Gina, you could remind me, but I believe there was at least one Point Melati art exhibit to date. Um, well, there there was um, some. <coughs> excuse me, uh, art. Uh, Gina, uh, what's what's her name? Regina. Regina. Um, Gilligan. Gilligan. Uh, Gilligan. Yeah, she. Um, along with others of us um, had some of our art at the Point Melody um, uh, Beach Park Earth Day event. And um, she also had arranged um, an online art exhibit and it included my art of Point Melate and Tarnal's art. Um, other than that, we really haven't had, um, you know, like a, a major uh, exhibit devoted to Point Melati art. And I think that's a great idea, Jamin. Yeah, I, I think it's do. art yeah. and photography. We have photography. Yeah. And, oh, uh, and also just what Jamin was saying, just oral histories, just the uh, recounting. I mean, that beach park was also um, a big refuge for the African-American community in the 50s and 60s when there wasn't official segregation, but there were a few beaches they could go and feel comfortable and I think another part of that history is the two years, the past two years of COVID when uh, you'd see a lot of the Richmond community, uh, all segments of the community was there with their kids. It was, it was a place um, that you could be out of doors and be out of lockdown and, uh, and yet be safe. And I think that uh, that's, that's gonna be part of Richmond's history as well. Um, and that was also reconnection that, that made protecting Point Melati viable for all all segments of our community and then i also have one more question um and this is more towards chevron um so when do we have detections out at point melati and can, have we done any sort of has any mapping been done of the Im impacts that when we have flares the impacts it's been having on the local wildlife and of the eelgrass beds uh when the, and things like that like, cause it, I didn't, it's one of those moments until you get to the top of the hill, you don't realize how eminent it is because they kind of feel like hidden. But when, once you get there, you go, oh, it's like right there, really at the, at the foot of it. And so I was wondering if, uh, if there has been any uh, sort of con connections that have been drawn towards the individual flarings and the direct impacts that are visible within the uh, park. I mean, there's air quality monitoring along the fence line. I'm not sure how much goes on in the park. Our, our mayor has argued that when there are accidents at Chevron, the prevailing winds are, are not headed in that direction, except when they are. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's certainly not only, I mean, have, you know, you, you don't want to live in a neighborhood with a bomb, whether it's, you know, in Ukraine or in Richmond. And that thing is, you know, at more than a century old. I mean, before it was Chevron and when it was Standard Oil, they weren't even generating gasoline because Henry Ford hadn't created a mass demand for autos. They were, they were generating kerosene for lamps. So it's definitely, you know, I mean, coal and oil were great energy systems for the 16th and 19th century. Um, we have to start considering decommissioning. But in the interim, um, I think there's been, you know, general air quality monitoring. I don't think it's been refined the level of um, Chevron's impacts 
uh, more interest and more work has been done in just cleaning up the remnants of Chevron's oil from World War II and, and until the closure. Um, but I do think that, uh, I mean, we did a video, I did a drone video for future residents of the uh, luxury resort, inviting them to meet the neighbors. And you just go up that ridge line and there's your neighbors, uh, you know, a massive petrochemical complex. So, you know, the craziest of the people who think that you can build like a, a Las Vegas adjunct uh, on an isolated headland or that, you know, 2000 well-to-do people are going to be dumb enough to want to live next to a refinery at the end of an inaccessible road. So, um, you know, from, as we've seen from environmental, economic, and other perspectives, it just makes sense to do what we want to do, which is finally protected as a park for the people. Um, monitoring, as I say, it's, it's mostly been about cleanup from legacy pollution. Right. Um, Debbie um, had a, a comment in the chat. And to take off from that for a second, there are two poets who have applied for funding to write a book about mm. Point Melody. It's a book of poetry. And it will include poems by Richmond residents as well. Um, that, and also Jeff Peterson, who's a Point Melody photographer, is putting together um, a web page of Point Melody's visual art. And we heard from those poets on Earth Day when we were celebrating down at uh, Point Melody, and they were pretty impressive. So, you know, maybe a cultural celebration of Point Melody with, again, bringing the best of the photography, the art, the poetry, the, the oral histories together. Um, and may, maybe combine it with a tour of Point Melody. Um, it's, it's a great idea, and I think it's, it's an initiative we should... Uh, we should pursue, right now we're pursuing an initiative to put out a third edition, which would be the first in two years of Richmond Community News because right now people are confused. There's a great opportunity to move forward. And yet uh, there's a lot of um, big lies out there. Maybe we can call them little lies from the mayor who's kind of like he and his two sons kind of do their tr Trump and family imitation. Um, so we need a, a, you know, community news, we need a new edition of the community news and we're working to raise the funds to get it out there and tell the story from many perspectives. But if we do the next community news, um, we should definitely include some of the best photography and maybe some of those poems and, uh, and as many, of course, diverse voices of memory and hope. Thank you, Sally. Um, David, I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on your own personal path of moving into writing uh, for the environment and maybe in the process um, help us to figure out ways that we can get the word out and amplify our voices. Um, yeah, like a lot of people, I mean, as, as a kid, I got inspired going to the beach and and you know, thought I was a generation too soon for visiting alien worlds and then got down to the Florida Keys and got a mask and snorkel and saw there was alien worlds just off the seawall there. Um, but then I got caught up in the moments and movements of the, of my times of the sixties and got distracted, ended up as a, you know, war reporter and later an investigative journalist and a PI and, you know, led a mostly schizophrenic life going off to cover wars and epidemics and special circumstance homicide investigation. So I could go home and body surf and uh, take a dive. And, you know, it's, it's, it resolved itself around 2002. Uh, when my second first book was the war against the greens, kind of looking at how industry is organized astroturf fake grassroots efforts to uh, basically protect their subsidies and destroy the environmental movement. And when they failed at that, they melded with the militias and blew up a federal building. Um, second book I'd always want to write was a book on the ocean, Blue Frontier, my first ocean book. And came out at a time where I just lost my partner and didn't know what to do. So I was gonna go back to war reporting because I knew that was a good antidote to depression. and. Um, <laughs> But then I got a call from Ralph Nader who read the last chapter of the Seaweed Rebellion 
which is what I think Point Melody Alliance is a part of the, the grassroots solution oriented movement that we have to scale up to, to turn the tide. And, uh, and so that was 20 years ago. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I, at the time I realized we're unfortunately always gonna have wars. We may not always have coral reefs or healthy eelgrass beds and kelp forests. And so that's the battle I've engaged in for the last 20 years. And uh, it's always tough. I mean, I'm coming out of a media industry that's shrinking, that's, uh, that's increasingly been corporatized where, you know, they want to maximize profits. And, uh, and that means cutting, cutting the expensive, socially useful projects like investigative reporting of foreign bureaus and, uh, and environmental uh, journalists. So, you know, it's, it's kind of following the money brought me to the environment. And then that brought me back to my first love, which was the ocean and the ocean is connected with the bay and it's all, all about the water. So I think, um, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's what's most surprising is we haven't gotten more coverage. Um, I'm too much of an advocate to write more than opinions and editorials, but I think there's a lot of um, opportunity um, for media outreach. And I think part of that is just having outreach to places like, you know, the Berkeley J School, but also, um, you know, people like Danny and, and young people in the Bay Area who are, and specifically in Richmond, who are very keen. They're, they're you know, very keen on social media. They all want to be um, filmmakers and they have the capacity now. You can do good quality video off a cell phone, you know, attach an external mic and you've got some great documentaries that have been made you know, that you can see on our website, like by the, you know, Richmond Confidential. Um, so yeah, we, we, we need to get the word out. I think you're always looking for a hook. And at the moment, um, the sort of broad hooks are one that opportunities have changed, that it looks like the big luxury developments not going forward. So now is an opportunity to like talk about, you know, extending the GGNR to the East Bay and making, you know, making Point Melody a kind of uh, pivot point for really developing a, a shoreline park system for the East Bay. And uh, the other is, is climate justice. I mean, it's all about um, what are the communities most at risk and what's equity mean in terms of access to uh, recreational opportunities like soccer fields and, and camping and hiking. And, you know, these are things that transform kids' lives and, and you know, put them on new paths. I, I just wrote a piece for National Geographic on the California Conservation Corps. And it's like, you know, 18 to 25 year olds who are, you know, moving out of jobs as, you know, dead end jobs at, you know, Amazon fulfillment centers. And, uh, you know, this, this one girl saying, you know, two years ago, I didn't know what a conservationist was. And I thought I was going to be in healthcare, but now I'm planting trees and I'm going to come back in 20 years and see a forest. And that's, that's my life now. So um, there's a lot of young people in, in Richmond who could have that life, um, but more likely to have it if we, you know, if we win and make Point Melody the, the center of, of a new, you know, rewilding of the East Bay. Thank you, David. Thanks, this is inspiring. Yes, thank you very much and, and thanks for your for your talk thanks to everyone for joining us and uh, please tune in next week for another exciting episode in speaking up for point malate and if you like speaking up for point malate put it all out on all your social media because this is a an amazing series that answers lots of questions yes thank you thank you thanks david thank you thank you Bye, all. Bye-bye.